am so excited to have Meryl here with us tonight. Uh, and this is our very first messaging call for our Messaging Monday. So tonight we are getting it started. Here's why I'm so excited to have Meryl. Uh, she is a recovering attorney, but messaging really matters to her. And what I love is when it wasn't working the way that she thought it should, they did something about it. She also uses a lot of data and Hi. science to help move the messaging. And so I think that's critically important too. And then she also co-founded the messaging huddles. And so tonight I'm gonna to give it to Meryl to talk to us about how she messages using a value, villain and vision, but also how she gets other folks engaged in the messaging. And I'll also know that she'll want you to know that the site that they had, Opal Messaging site is fabulous. So Meryl, I'm gonna turn it over to you and let's talk messaging. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I love the music. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen. And then we can get going. Oops. All right. I got to get into present mode. Hold on a second. Okay. So hopefully everyone can see my screen right now. You all good. Excellent. So uh, I'm excited to be kicking off your, your messaging Mondays, which is great name. And we're going to be talking tonight about messaging to win, right? Which is obviously what we all want to do when we're messaging is to be successful and effective. And what we found is that if you follow these five main messaging principles to guide you when you message, you're more likely to to find success and to have that win. So, and we're going to go into to all of these in a little bit more detail. But you're going to want to tell a simple, compelling story. You're never going to want to tell your opponent's story. So you're never going to want to repeat, even to respond or or repute. You're going to want to follow that three B framing structure that you saw, I think, in the in the teaser for this meeting, which is the value villain vision statement. You're going to want to keep in mind that a message is like a relay baton. So it has to be passed to be successful. And finally, you're going to want to make sure that you align your messages under your campaign, whatever your campaign might be, so that they're all uh, serving your purpose. So with regard to that first um, that first principle, you're going to want to be telling a simple, compelling story. And to do that, um, you're going to want to remember that compelling stories center people and evoke emotion. So you don't want to end up with an audience that looks like this fellow over here. He's uh, not very engaged by what he is reading or hearing. So this is an example of a not um, message. It's, I'm not going to you know, <laughs> read it uh, because it's not a, a good example of a message, but it's essentially too steeped in, in details and drudgery and not talking about the impact on people. So it's talking about the COVID relief bill and talking about the child tax credit, but not in human terms. So instead, if you just said simply that, you know, Biden lifted 3.8 million children out of poverty, that's much more impactful. And it gets that kind of a reaction from the woman that we're seeing, right? Because we're talking about the people who are impacted and how they're impacted. So you wanna make people the focal point of your messages. And compelling stories focus on the outcome, not on the policy or procedure, right? So it's the similar to what a, a not Shanker Osorio, who's one of the probably leading progressive messengers in the world talks about, you want to um, forget about the recipe, right? You're not focusing on the policy or procedure as she puts it. It's impolite to take your policy out in public. That's something we keep to ourselves. 
even though we all love it, we tend to be as activists, as progressive activists, um, you know, particularly of our indivisible kind of vintage, um, not, not the, the younger folks. We love the wonky stuff. We love the details, the policy, all of that, but that's not necessarily making for the most effective uh, messaging. So again, if you look at this message, it's um, getting very, you know, a little bit wonky in terms of the specifics of what President Biden's infrastructure bill is doing. Um, you know, talking about the money, it's talking about the specific components and the names of the little pieces of the policy. So instead, a message like this would be much more impactful to tell the same story. So thanks to President Biden, all Americans, regardless of income, whether living in the country, city, or on tribal lands, can soon work, learn, and play online using accessible high-speed broadband. So you can see how that's much more of a compelling narrative than when you get lost in the minutia of the policy. So you wanna keep in mind that you're always wanting to be selling that juicy, delicious brownie, not the recipe, not the ingredients that make up that brownie. And then compelling stories paint a visual picture. So we don't want to be saying something like, the vast majority of Muslims pose no threat to our security. We also don't want to be um, painting a visual picture that's um, sort of, you know, tragedy porn, right? We want to be invoking empathy, not sympathy or horror in terms of being effective with our messages. So instead, this would be a better message to make that same point. Muslim Americans are our neighbors and our coworkers. They are the kids in our schools and the parents in our parks. So you wanna think about drawing a picture with your words and also that on the other side, the recipient of your message can also see and imagine what you are saying as a picture. And compelling stories get retold, right? If you hear a good story, you're going to want to tell it again and again. And we need to also make sure that our stories are told again and again if we want them to stick and have resonance. It's definitely an area that we as Democrats have problem with. Um, you know, in, in our defense, there's a lot going on, especially these days that needs to be dealt with and responded to, but it's important that we remember to continue to tell our story after victory. So we delivered this in outcome to these people in these places. So polling data, for example, shows now people have long forgotten about COVID relief bill, the stimulus check they may have gotten. Those were important victories and outcomes that were delivered, but people forget them if we don't continue to, to tell them. And it's important to boast, right? It, it, um, and now this is the second principle that we're going to be talking about. This is the um, framing every message through the three Bs. So we're going to want to um, talk about value at the beginning, you wanna start each message with a shared value that crosses race and class. We're going to want to, well, I actually, it should be and gender too at this point since the Republicans have now taken to really um, focusing a lot on that as their latest culture war. So I would say race and class and gender. Um, then with respect to the next piece of your message is the villain. You want to be describing the villain who's blocking execution of this value and reveal their motivation. And often that is going to have to do, um, you know, well, not the motivation, but often the tactics will have to do with uh, racial animus that they're often using race to um, try and effectuate their blocking. I apologize for my dog. And then finally, you always want to end 
he doesn't want to play with you, Winnie. You're going to always want to end with your vision, which is your shared view of what the future will hold when the group that you're speaking to and addressing comes together to overcome the barrier that the villain has placed in front of you. And we're gonna break that down a little bit. So uh, first is the value. So you're gonna to wanna to start with that shared value, right? That crosses race and class. You always start with what you want, not with what you're responding to. So for these next uh, couple of messages or the components of the message, we're gonna talk about that in the context of education. So an example of a value might be all parents, black or white, rich or poor, urban or rural, want their children to receive a quality education that prepares them for future success. So what we want is a quality education for our children that readies them for future success. And we're also making clear that we have that in common, right? That we have that in common across race, across class, across geography, so we're building that empathy and we're bringing a larger group um, together to share in that value with us. Next, in your message, you're going to want to name the villain and ascribe their motive. So as an example, in the same education context, but today certain politicians use race baiting and falsehoods to divide and distract us from their failure to adequately fund public education. Obviously this works in all sorts of contexts. This is just you know, one particular factual example. But what you want to notice here is that you're calling out the villain. In this case, it's certain politicians. You don't want to be overly broad with your villain description. It's important to not to say, all politicians or even um, all you know, Republicans. It's always best to have that qualifier, in this case, that certain politicians or the you know, wealthiest corporations or whatever it might be that you're very specific with who your villain is and that you're also very specific with the tactics that they're using and the motivation. And then you're going to want to end with that vision of a better future. So if we come together to support leaders who put our children first, we can ensure all students receive an honest, well-funded education where they learn to reckon with the mistakes of our past so they can create a better future for us all. So, you know, in this case, what the action is that you're trying to invoke is, um, supporting the right kind of leaders. It could be if we all show up at the next school board meeting and speak out, it could be, um, you know, if we march, you know, whatever it might be that you think is the call to action, you want to make clear what it is that you're asking people to do and make sure that you um, talk about, you know, people coming together. That's the, the, goal of the end of your message, right? If we all do this together, we can achieve our, our vision, which is usually the execution of our value that we started with, what we want. Now we get to that third messaging principle that a message is like a relay race baton. So to win, to be successful, it has to get passed from person to person without getting dropped. So this is another you know, really important thing to keep in mind as we're messaging, because this is another area where I think we sometimes have problems in terms of understanding who we want to be the end recipient of our message and making sure that it gets all the way there. Oops, there we go. So to accomplish that, you're going to need simplicity, right? So you think about that game of telephone from you know when we were kids, you sit around in the circle and you say something to the person next to you and then they whisper it and so on and it goes all the way around. And by the time it gets around the circle, it's 
nowhere resembles what you might have said to the first person sitting next to you. So we don't want that. <laughs> we want it to get all the way around the same message. So you want to think about it being something a second grader could explain to another second grader. And you're also going to want to make sure that your message has resonance. So this is um, what I was referring to initially in that it has to get from audience to audience and it's going to have to capture the excitement, the emotions of all of those people along the route. So you can't preach to the choir, which is us. So we are activists, we're not the base. We're already a step removed from the base. So messages that might register with us. So for example, here in Ohio, I hear a lot of messaging about Republican corruption because we do have a very corrupt government and we've had some pretty impressive scandals and there's articles, oh, Ohio is like the most you know, corrupt political state in the union. But that's not a message that has a lot of resonance through to the persuadables, right? In this case, most of our persuadables, at least you know, from my perspective here in Ohio, are people who don't necessarily always turn out and vote, but we want them to vote, right? And so a lot of those people are already very susceptible to cynicism. That's usually the, the enemy for most of us, for most of our voters. It's not necessarily Republican voting, it's more, cynicism and not voting, right? That inaction. So we want to think about what message we want to be sending to those final persuadables. And that's the message that we want to be delivering to the first group that we're speaking with, which may be, you know, your base. But we want then our base to be excited by the message so that they share it broadly. And so then it gets to those persuadables. The fourth uh, messaging principle is that you never want to tell or repeat your opponent's story. Another one that um, a lot of us have trouble with, I know I've had a, a good bit of trouble with this one in the past, um, the, the, the lawyer brain, you're eager to you know, respond, refute, you know, oh, this is so easy to, to respond to, I'm gonna shut that person right up. But we wanna make sure that we're telling our story. And our message, our story focuses on what we seek, not on what we oppose. So when you repeat your opponent's message, even to refute it, it amplifies that and it gives it power. So here is um, an example of the difference between phrasing and messages, one as an opposition message and one as a, a forward leaning message, right? So a lot of us, um, and I think, you know, you, particularly in Virginia, were the recipient of that initial barrage of critical race theory messaging. And, you know, what I saw initially is this response on the left, or a lot of this, right? You know, critical race theory, it's a legal theory. It doesn't get taught in, in elementary schools. It happens in law schools, you know, yada, yada. So very much like, well, this is ridiculous. Like, why are you talking about critical race theory? It doesn't happen here. It doesn't matter. It's not relevant. This is what it is. That doesn't work. So, um, you know, just to, I guess, this is a teeny bit of an aside, the reason why it doesn't work is that parents still think there's something going on in the school. A lot of people are concerned about something. There's a lot of smoke. Something's happening there. I don't care what it's called, um, but you know, this technical counter argument is not going to allay my fears as a parent, sending my child off and thinking that something bad is happening, that my kids are gonna come home you know, feeling confused, feeling ashamed or feeling victimized. Um, so instead, what you wanna do is have your forward leaning message. We all want, and again, building that bridge, we all want an honest education for our children so they can learn important critical thinking skills, understand the truth of our history, 
and graduate ready to succeed and help make our country a better place for us all. Um, you know, and some of the specifics of that message, you know, as with some, some other sort of bigger messages are also based on polling data and what works in terms of moving people. But as a general proposition, that message also sort of meets those criteria that we're talking about, focusing on what you want. So when you share your opponent's message, even to criticize it, you are improving your opponent's analytics. So this is the side relates to you know, social media and where metrics are, are important. So we still see a lot of, particularly on places like Twitter, where people will say, oh, look at the latest horrible thing that Trump said. Or can you believe that, you know, this MAGA Republican video, when you share it, you are improving their analytics, which is how that social media channel determines how preferential a treatment to give that message in the feeds of others. So by your sharing it, you have helped boost that message so that it might now be seen by more people, including your people who you've shared it to, who may miss the characterization or the rebuttal that you've framed. But more importantly, you're also just overall giving that message a statistical boost, which you don't want to do. If you absolutely have to share your opponent's message for some reason, screenshot it, don't retweet it or respond to it. The other reason why this is important is because of how our brains work. And so this has been studied and we tend to ignore words of negation. So those little important words like not, <laughs> doesn't, um, sort of just floats right through. And what we retain are all the rest of the words around it. So the message that you're directly refuting is the message that actually often is what remains in the minds and memories of your audience. So you really don't want to be doing that. Okay, fifth um, principle is that you want to align your messages under a single campaign. So, um, you know, for, for us as, for example, you know, Grassroots Messaging Works, which is the, um, you know, website that um, <laughs> Mal was mentioning in terms of the resources that are there, our, our broad campaign was saving our democracy. Now that's, not a good message to specifically message on because that's very um, esoteric and a lot of people don't relate to that, but it still helps guide when we're choosing how to frame messages and how to prioritize messages, right? That you still want all of your, you know, ducks to be moving in the same row, or in this case, all of your people moving in the same as part of your arrow. So think about how you can tie back whatever your message is if it's simply to get out and vote then maybe you know each message might be you know so if you're talking about row um you know row was overturned women's rights and freedoms are on the ballot make sure to vote you know whatever it is you want to just keep like circling back and then you can also build into it that value vision, you know, um, that value bill and vision statement as part of that. It's harder with Twitter, you have four fewer characters, but you know, you could do a thread, but you still want to get all of that um, incorporated as best that you can. Um, so uh, just to, you know, again, to sort of characterize like what our, you know, our deeper um, thinking is that you know we're focusing on everything through that lens of anti-democracy versus pr 
pro-democracy. So are you part of the MAGA Republicans? Are you on team Trump? Are you on team coup? Or are you on team you? Are you on you know, pro-people, pro-voting, pro-freedom? Um, so, you know, we're in a war to save our democracy and, you know, we won in 2018 and 2020, we can, we must do it again. So, um, you know, at this point, what I could do is just come off, um, you know, stop the sharing and see if people have, you know, questions on any of those things. Um, and then we can see from there, like, you know, what else you might be interested in in talking about. I think you talk, mentioned the huddles, we could talk more about that. So, but I'm gonna stop sharing for the moment. So if you wanna ask questions, raise your hand and I'll let Finel start first with questions. Finel, you're on mute. That's because Hershey's barking. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Meryl, thank you so much. My first question is, are we going to be able to get these slides after? Yes, I can send you the slides. Yeah. Okay, that would be fantastic. And so I, I, I would like for us to, to get to the huddle part because that's a wonderful action that I think we all can do. So we can talk about that. But, but I'd like to just start with a couple of questions around uh, the villain, uh, the vision, no, 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 values, villain, vision in terms of how we use that. So, um, Here's my here's my first thought. I was reading the paper today, and I love how we talk about persuadables because they are the base, but they seem to be really um, antsy right now. So as we would think about messaging to our base and giving them confidence about what's happening, how would you think about that as we're talking to them in terms of using uh, this the three Bs? And I'm sorry, so... Um... You're just saying in general, or is there a specific topic that you wanted to be? Yes. So why don't I tell you? Because that's the big one. So what I'm what, what I'm reading today is that the, our base, our persuadables, are very concerned about inflation, and so they seem to be just sort of all wrapped up yeah. inside of that and feel like we're doing a really poor job because we're not solving their inflation problem. So how would we? Uh, how would you think about that in terms of the three Bs? Right. Okay. So, um, so a couple of things. Um, first, just as a prelude, just to maybe resolve your, you know, concerns a little bit, just from a statistical sense, is that when people um, people are very concerned about inflation, top of mind, costs of of goods, top of mind, but the our base are not necessarily assuming that it's Biden's fault. They don't care for him, right, in general, right? He's underwater, but it's not that there's some specific thought by our voters that if we just replace Dems, we would be doing better on inflation. So, um, you know, just as a background. So what we want to do, right, is, is if you were speaking to someone at the door that you want to make sure that you're acknowledging where they are and what they're concerned about, right? So it is totally fair and it, you know, is, is very difficult when everything that we, you know, use and purchase and our gas is going, is going up, right? So we all want to be able to take care of our families to be able to afford rent, to be able to fill up our car and to be able to buy groceries, you know, to, to, to feed our children. You know, but today, because of some things not within our control, the pandemic, the supply chain crisis, the, you know, war between, you know, Russia and Ukraine, and some things that should be within some of our control if Republicans would be taking the responsibility that they should be, we are in this position. So for example, there are corporations right now, wealthy corporations, often the same ones that are not paying what they owe that are profiting off of the, the problems that we're all facing, 
you know, that this worldwide inflation is, is, is happening, but there's some corporations that have taken this opportunity to jack up their prices. And the Republicans are refusing to take on these corporations to make sure that they're paying what they owe, that we're standing up to this consolidation problem, that we're fighting for fair wages. Um, and in addition, we're also dealing with uh, you know, the, the gas uh, pricing, which again, Republicans have refused to address through legislation. So we all want what's best for our families and our children. Um, the, the Democrats are, are, are trying, right? There's some things that are beyond our control and they're gonna continue to push the things that are in our control. And if we all come together and if we deliver the election results that we need in November and get those additional seats in the Senate, then we can finally prevent us from being vulnerable to the, not the whims because it's deliberate, but the greed of these you know, morbidly rich corporations and the people who would choose to put profits, you know, over people. Perfect. So, and so these- Too so, long, so, but yeah, but- um, yeah, so, so, so this could be used at the door, on the phone. Um, it could be used if you're writing. So this, this whole three Vs can be the crust of our conversation no matter what we're doing. And certainly you could shorten it based on where and how and who yes. you're talking to and the subject. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so Robin, I'm looking for hands and I don't see any. Is that right? Uh, oh, there's Melissa. Go ahead, go ahead. I always have questions, you know that. <laughs> Just waiting my turn. Um, this is all extremely helpful. And, and the more that we repeat this and get in the mindset, the more naturally it'll come when we're out in the wild and talking with people. Uh, one of my main concerns, though, is when you have such strong, um, even though it's erroneous messaging coming from the far right, and I live in a very red rural area right now, um, and they're the catchphrases that you talked about, they glom onto those, whether they're true or not, facts don't matter. Um, I understand not wanting to repeat what they're saying and repeat their issue, but there are, we need to have effective counter statements that we can come out with as quickly. Um, the CRT thing just got totally blown up, as you said, into something that it was totally not, but it was a dog whistle to those on the far right. And so how do we come up with something that is positive, but can counter that in real time, kind of like a SWAT force? Right. Well, yeah. And the, the CRT one, um, at least from what I was seeing, but I wasn't in the state, it just really seemed like two ships passing in the night, um, like that they were not addressing it. And they were just doing the, you know, it's not applicable. And let me tell you that he's just like Trump. He's just like Trump. And that doesn't work, right? So you do, you do have to respond. It's just, you wanna do it in the, in the context of an affirmative message. So for like CRT, for example, it would be, you know, all parents, you know, black or white, urban or rural, rich or poor, want a quality education for their children that prepares them for success and want to have them taught the truth of their history so they can reckon with the mistakes of our past and make a better future for us all. But right now we have Republicans who are deliberately using race baiting tactics and you know telling untruths about what our teachers and our schools are doing to try to divide us against one another so that they can have political success um but it, you know it's and there's different you know permutations of that um and some of these things and this is what gets a little bit frustrating for me with with our Democratic Party is have had a lot of field study. So like CRT, um, 
there's been a lot of focus groups, right? They've talked to voters, like they they have like, you know, like I'm just winging it now using like the three Vs, but um, there's specific messages that you can just cut and paste. I mean, essentially, and that, you know, we know what, what works best with voters and what doesn't work best with voters. So for example, like early on with the inflation, you know, one one possible messaging was that, well, it, the problem isn't how much things cost, the problem is how little we make. Why do we have so little? Seemed great, it doesn't work. You know, so they've gone out, they test, like that was what Anat Shankar sorry, was saying over and over again. And then they went out in the field and they was like, well, we tried it, it doesn't work, so go with this. Um, so some of it is, you know, based upon, you know, we wanna make sure that we're using the framework, but where there's, where there's data and there's actual tested messaging, we wanna make sure that we're, you know, incorporating that into our messages. So when I share, like I can share the slides, but I can also share, um, uh, the, probably the, the probably the best one-stop shop to find the latest messaging is probably we make the future. So I can, you know, share a link to that website as well. So uh, Meryl, I'm willing to be uh, to be used as a um, a guinea pig, and I'll and I'll tell you two things. So. Um, Robbie, can you bring me up? Uh, I'm, I'm willing to. I'm willing to be a guinea pig. So I will tell you two things. But one, uh, I made a mess of the messaging around CRT when I was running. I, I was one of those people who said, you know, we don't teach CRT. Blah blah blah. We all and, did that. I yes. did that. That was what we thought we were supposed to do. Yeah. So I, I, I did. That. So and so around inflation, I will tell you uh, what what I say about inflation. And so I. I so this is someone says, well, inflation is really terrible. And, and I say, you know, inflation really is terrible. And everybody wants to be able to afford, you know, to feed their families. And everybody wants to be able to afford to put gas in the car. It is all really difficult right now. And we have companies that are gouging us. And I will tell you that we had 207 Republicans who did not lift a finger to help with gas prices. And so if we want to fix this, we're going to have to come together and vote differently. But what I will say to you, if Jesus Christ is walking on earth right now, based on the crisis that we've had in terms of a pandemic, in terms of the war with Ukraine, he'd have a difficult time getting us through this cycle. So we all got to stick together. And if we do that, we can come out of this. It's all in who we trust to help us out. That's yeah, so price gouging is, is big. So like I should have, you know, like, again, I was just spinning from, from, off the cuff, but if you look at the specific messages on inflation, the recommended message, price gouging works. So people are willing to believe that it's price gouging. Um, that's more effective than like blaming it on Putin, um, for example. So yeah, so price gouging is good. People understand that people will, you know, accept that. Um, starting with empathy is, you know, is really important. So that's good. You don't want to, you know, diminish people's real feelings by saying, well, everyone has inflation, which is true. Like the whole world is suffering from inflation. If you think our gas prices are high, just, you know, look at some of the other countries, but I mean, you can include that, but you want to start by affirming like where people are. So yeah, I think that's, you know, great. I mean, the religion thing, like it may or may not work depending on like who you're talking to. Um, but um, I'm but, just being honest. I'm telling, I'm telling it on myself. <laughs> yeah. But it, but, but the, you know, but the broader metaphors, you know, that there's just, if this is not something that you can just push a button and get rid of, like, I mean, Yes, and so and here's where like I would probably get too wonky, um, but you know the reality is that the only like the only way we I wouldn't say this at the doors, but the the only way that we wouldn't be in a, a in the situation that we're in, and it's just a possibility, would be if people didn't get relief during COVID, 
And if people didn't get the support that they needed to get through that time and to get their stimulus checks and to be able to survive that, that's what Republicans want. I mean, this part you could say. So the Republicans have not come forward with any solutions for inflation. The only solutions we know that they would offer, which is the same stuff that they've, you know, offered in the past would have been to not have provided relief and to not do it in the future if it's needed. And they want to cut, you know, social security and Medicaid. That's the only policies that we have heard at all from any of the Republicans that are running other than the made up culture wars. So, you know, I mean, and, and I think it, it might be worth, again, depending on the kind of conversation you were having, certainly not in a, like a written message, but if you're talking to someone at the door who's struggling with this, just think about asking them, what, do, what is the solution that the Republicans are proposing? Because the only solutions that I'm hearing would be to take on the price gouging, to take on corporate consolidation. You know, those are the areas that we do have some room to to maneuver and that's certainly not happening with the republicans so and if we were at the door we'd probably be doing more listening and so and i think and as we're listening at the door then that gives us an opportunity a really good opportunity somewhere during the conversation at the end to, to put in the three b's yeah robin you can take me off are there any more questions yes diana richard um you're next Diana Richardson, are you there? You're off. You're off mute. Um, you know what, Diana? We'll come back to you because maybe your audio is not working. Um, and uh, Bonnie, why don't you come? And Diane, maybe you can work on your audio and come back in when you can. This sounds really great. And part of what concerns me is I've been running a postcarding group with 1200 postcards for Elaine Luria that basically say, hi, you may not know it, but I'm your new representative in this district. It, the wording's a little different. And you're, you know, and you're really lucky to have Elaine Luria representing you. And I'm thinking, this message sucks. You know, it lets people know that she's the new representative. That's fine. But how do we get our candidates on board with some messaging that works? Because I have, you know, this is, I've been doing postcards since 2017, and a lot of the stuff is just awful. Yeah, I mean, so we did um, a big, a couple of big messaging trainings in Ohio, and we did get some of our candidates or their members of their team for like the, the bigger ones, you know, the Senate race and the gubernatorial race to, to come, um, you know, but it, it's hard. <laughs> so, I mean, that would really be the one thing that I would suggest is to consider like doing your own, like, you know, doing a training and inviting them, you know, and trying to encourage like the, the party, maybe the state or the county parties to encourage candidates to attend. Um, it's, yeah. I mean, I'm not sure, uh, or the other solution is to, to not do postcards through them, but to do it yourself. I mean, that's a lot of what we also do in Ohio. It's just, you know, sort of in some ways, you know, not given up on the candidates in terms of not wanting them to win, but the ones that aren't good and then the party, you know, we just do our own thing. You know, we cut our own turf, we write our own scripts, we, do our own post, you know. Can you give an example of uh, some of the scripts that you've come up with? Oh, so um, I could share if you want, but we're doing um, deep canvassing now because we're, you know, many months out and we're focusing on our surge voters. So, which are just voters that you know, came out in 2018, but didn't come out in 2014, right? So these are people that don't typically vote in, in midterms. 
um, or there are people that you know didn't vote at all in 2016. They sat that one out and came out in 2018. Um, so I can let me just see if I still have it up. One second. I was actually just talking with someone about it. Um, uh, this is this is great. And so I, I think that's hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Um, Diane, we can hear you now, but why don't, um, we're working on another question. So we'll come back to you as soon as we're done with this one. OK, OK, great. All right. So, I mean, it's going to be a bit overwhelming if you've never done deep canvassing. So um, but like this is the the current script that we're starting to use at the doors and we're going to use in like a virtual phone bank. This would not be for obviously a postcard, um, but um, you know, it's, um, it's designed to, to get these people committed to vote and to get them re-energized. And so what, you know, we're doing is um, first making sure that we're speaking to Dems um, that are people with this Trump question and then personal stories is sort of the hallmark of deep canvassing, but we're introducing it with, with this question about what drove them to turn out and vote in 2018, 2020, seeing if we can recapture the emotions because at the end of the day, at the end of the conversation, what we're really hoping is that this voter comes away feeling as motivated to vote as they did then, right? Because the only way we win this midterm is if this midterm does not correspond with historical practice, right? So we know historically the you know, president's party loses in the midterms and Biden's underwater. So if we follow just sort of historical norms, we're not gonna win, but we're not in a normal time, right? And voter turnout in 2018 and 2020 was not normal. It was hugely abnormal and um, particularly for democratic voting. So if we can, remind people and make sure they understand that that emotional moment, it continues as strongly now as it did then, then we can be in a different you know, position and be like the historical moments when midterm voting you know, defied that norm. Um, and so, and then we're reminding people here about the last two years, because we do know from the data that people don't know or they've forgotten um, what has been achieved and then like, you know, we're in Ohio and things are awful. So we're, you know, wanting to sort of poke people a little bit, remind them on that, and then ask them to think about what's most significant to them of those things, the good or the bad. Um, and then we're going to remind people about the threat, right? That the threat remains that if we don't succeed in this election, Trump or someone else like Trump will be installed in 24, regardless of what the voting is. And then this is our voting scale question, um, trying to suss out any hesitation why someone might not vote and see if we can address that. Um, and then, um, you know, these are more practical questions. We wanna get their phone number so we can text them. Um, uh, if you're doing canvassing, this is how you ask for that. You don't ask, can I have your phone number? Would you mind giving me your phone number? I think this is what works and it does work. Um, and then um, we have a tool that we're using to try to stay in touch with people. Um, so that's just sort of a very- So Meryl, what I meant was the script you used postcards. Oh, postcards, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, yeah, no, I do not have like, um, I, don't, I don't personally organize like you know, a lot of our people do, but I don't personally organize like postcard events. Um, so I don't have a script for that. I don't know, like I know Vote Forward um, has had pretty successful data results. Those are letters, but it's pretty similar in terms of the amount of work. It's just they go in an envelope um, and the postage is a little bit higher, but that's, um, you know, something worth considering. Like doing that. Um, I don't know if Virginia is one of their states or not, if not the problem. No, but I was um, in postcards, you can, you know, you can't write that much. And uh, I just wrote out the three sentences that were that you had in that message. 
And that's a lot for a postcard to write in that. So you need something that's short, succinct, but still has that same kind of power. So I just was wondering if you would manage yeah. to get that in one or two or three sentences, because that's really all you have, right? Yeah. I mean, you can't write a whole, a, a and long. I, I would have to think about it, like, um, but the, the best postcard, it probably wouldn't be about a, a person. I mean, and that's part, again, part of the problem with, with the, the campaign. It's that the, the most important message is that, like, you know, all of our freedoms are on the ballot this November. You know, we, you know, I mean, whatever you wanted to talk about, row, guns, whatever, vote. I mean, that's the thing, you know, if we come together and vote, we can take this country back, you know, we're at a tipping point, you know, whatever you want to, um, which is one of the problems with how we organize, right, as a party, it's that if you're writing, you know, not to, you know, I don't know who this person is, but this candidate, not to be offensive to her, but like, it's just not that exciting to the type of voters that we need to be talking to, these infrequent voters to say, go vote for your representative, who's you but see. Like, you know, why? Like by the time you've introduced Susie Wetsy, you haven't been able to, to, to say something else. So, um, you know. Um, well, thank you. Um, Bonnie, did you have any other questions before we move on to Diane? Not sure if that helps. But All right, thanks. Diane, it's, you've got the microphone. Okay, can you hear me now? We can hear you. We can't see you, um, but we can hear you. Well, I'm, uh, I'm in Southwest Virginia, and um, the Democrats tried to do what was best for us and, and got broadband, but of course it isn't here yet, and that's why I'm having all this trouble. So I'll just um, start with that. But anyway, I'm on my phone now trying to get through to you. Um, and, I, and right now I am missing a Board of Supervisors meeting so I could be at the Zoom meeting to let you know how critical this issue is for us. And it's uh, similar to what you were speaking about to Melissa, I believe, first. Um, right now, uh, it isn't critical race theory, but um, there is a special offshoot of the Republican Party that um, has caused a lot of problems for our school board members are trying to cause problems stating that um, we're trying to indoctrinate students, that, that teachers are trying to indoctrinate students and, um, you know, groom them, and that it's a slippery slope, that the things that parents might think are innocuous, that, you know, it's, it's going to be a, a problem down the road. So you, you get the gist of it. Yeah. So uh, the Democrats tried to start aid because um they had not been attending the school board or board of supervisors meetings to counter this um i feel like that's very important however um as, as this meeting is about how our messaging lots of times is not that good it's actually <laughs> bad and i felt like it was important to listen to this and try to learn about messaging now my specific question is you know, uh, when you were talking about, of course, canvassing, and it de depends on who you're talking to, you can sometimes talk about what Republicans um, are doing. At, at these meetings, um, we're trying not to, um, you know, name call, you know, talk about different groups like Democrats versus Republicans, because we want to keep it um, about what's good for our children, what we all want uh, to be best for our children. And we're coming as citizens to this meeting. And so I guess I'm, I'm asking, um, ex could you help me a little bit <laughs> specifically about the kinds of things that we would want to bring forth that, um, as, a, as a message when we get up before the Board of Supervisors or School Board? So just to be clear, I'm sorry, are you trying to influence the, the school board or are you worried about elections 
we are oh, we're trying to influence uh, the school board and any citizens that might be listening because their right. ultimate goal is to try to um, elect all Republican uh, school board members and uh, if if possible uh, right. board supervisors too. But basically, right now they're really focused on the school board, trying to elect Republicans who will do what they want and what they want. Um, is that uh, they want to take the kids out of public schools and use the money for vouchers for um, private or charter or religious schools. And, um, you know, that they want the public schools to pay for this or not have as many students. Yeah, so... Um... So a couple of things. So in terms of like addressing the like the don't say gay kind of bills um, for schools, which you know we're we're facing a lot of that kind of stuff as well in Ohio and the anti-trans movement, all of that. Um, uh, first off, like parents are not that fooled by the they're not that enamored right of the don't say gay bill kind of stuff. So that a little bit of comfort right just so we know from some of the, the the polling and focus groups and all that but in terms of taking it on if the the conversation is specifically about the the money going out the vouchers i mean i think a message like you know again starting with the same place like we all want a quality education for our children and you know we know that the the best education is is public education when it's delivered equitably and well and mm -hmm. certain and i you know whether certain politicians or maga republicans um so again in general i don't know where you live and and the makeup of your board but um MAGA republicans trump republicans are not well liked right now probably even more disliked than trump so go ahead and name and shame them. So, you know, MAGA Republicans are trying to, you know, make us scared okay. and fear and, and divide us by race so that they can take public funds and use them to support their private parochial schools, okay. which will, you know, detriment the education for all of us. Um, okay, those are really, really good um, um, points that we can try to make. I see that people are asking what county in Virginia. It's Montgomery County. It's um, it is a university. Blacksburg is here. It's uh, it's where I'm from. It's a university town, Virginia Tech, but the county itself is a rural Southwest Virginia county. Right now, our um, our school board and our Board of Supervisors are kind of divided. It's not all Republican, not all Democrats. It's, it's, it's divided. Yeah, so that's, I mean, so that I think that is an opportunity then to try to make the Republicans on the board fear that they will be branded as MAGA extremists okay. if they support this. Um, okay. And then I like the point that Catherine made too, like about the, um, the, the outsiders with money um, that's, you know, another uh, villain that you can talk about, you know, particularly, you know, you, like that the, they're here because they make money off of these, you know, for-profit schools, or they're here oh, because right. they want our country to become a, you know, single white Christian nation, like, you know, all mm -hmm. governed by the same religion, you know, and that's just not the founding of our country, you know, whatever their motivations right. are, if it's a religious thing, if it's a money thing, both. Um, wow, this has been so helpful. I can't tell you. It's been great. All of these. Points. Oh, good. Well, I'm glad. Oh, yeah, um, we can we can use them. <laughs> that's, and I can send you some other like resources I did recently and an email that had a bunch of messaging like updated messaging guidelines um, as well as the the you know some of the links that I had mentioned in the slides and you know if anyone has any additional questions they can reach out 
Nancy, um, Nancy Morgan, you had a question and then you put your hand down. Do you want to come on and ask it? And then I know you're getting towards the end, but if no one has, but I could just really quickly show you and then I can share it what our huddle host kit looks like if that's something that you all wanted to like think about doing does that make sense just for the absolutely uh, great okay. uh, let me just pull that up one second Finally. All right, sorry about that. It took me a little bit to find that one. Okay, so I'm sorry, I have to make everything bigger because I have old eyes. Um, so this is what our huddle host or huddle program um, turned into we used to I had created separate materials for each week that I had doled out originally to the huddle host and then after the initial pilot when we got feedback back some people were just starting um, some people had you know finished and were looking for other stuff to do and realized that it made sense to have something that people could use on their own, like self-timed, so that whenever they wanted to dive in or if their group wanted to spend more time on a certain topic, they could. And so that then resulted in this huddle host kit, which, um, you know, it's a Google Doc and I can and share it with you all. Um, and what it does is it's intended to support huddles, which is what we just call groups of people getting together to work on their messaging skills and we did it by messaging on specific topics so one of which was you know critical race theory one of which was inflation um so and we tried to do a combination of teaching and and doing at the same time so um you know you'll see that there's a lot of links in the document and that it has starts out with links to our two trainings. I mentioned that we did those two big state trainings, um, one of which we actually hosted, but it was actually put on by the folks at um, Words with uh, Words with Win. Words that Win. That's bad. Um, uh, training, and so they provided the training, and then the second one we let ourselves. So there's those two video recordings. If anyone wanted to like look, they go more in detail into what I talked about at the beginning. And then it's these three um, modules. And so each module like had some background information. So what the host might want to use with the other people to help teach them. And then um, specific things that related to, um, so I'm sorry, let me take a step back. So these are a bunch of background resources just that go to, to in general, right? Um, so this is um, a Not Shank or Osorio's podcast, which is very good. We Make the Future is the one that I mentioned that has, the, it's the current home for the race class narrative. So it has a lot of the most up-to-date messaging guides, slide decks, those kinds of things. Um, and words that win is the uh, group that um, came in and did that training for us and they have a good newsletter that comes out. So our first module, which was on critical race theory, we said, okay, you might wanna take a look at this portion of the material from the training that we had done. Um, and then here was like just an example, like here's the worksheet that went with this module. So it's teaching the race class narrative, which is essentially that values villain vision um, format, 
with a specific attention to race rather than ignoring race, which is often what has happened in the past. And then um, it's leading into the example. So you're going to lead with value. So this is, I'm not gonna pull it up, but it's a really handy guide made by the words that win folks that start sentences. So it gives you tips for, um, well, I will just, it'll just make it easier, quicker. So they um, have sentence starter, shared values, named villains, um, visions, right? Cause you get, sometimes you find yourself saying the same things over and over again. So rather than doing that, like go and, and cheat, look at what they've done. Um, and then, so it says five minutes, write your shared value and then name your villain. Um, and it's a reminder about, you know, using active voice. Um, and then it's writing your vision statement, putting it all together. So little reminders to teach people about how to do it well, but then, you know, also in the context of actually a productive message, right? And then we had homework um, for our module. So in this case, you know, you've now created a message. So go ahead and share it or look at these sample social media posts on critical race theory and share one of those, um, you know, and then get ready for the, the next huddle, right? And the next one similar, but the guide had a little bit less um, meat to it. So starting to take the training wheels off like a little bit in module two, which was the inflation module. Um, I think that when the homework was writing a letter to the editor. So we had some resources on writing a letter to the editor um, here, like tips and tricks. And then, you know, module three, there was, I think, no worksheet on this one, um, but there was still some support, like some messaging guides, um, and some suggested like homework. And then we went on just to say, you know, now you can keep going and you can do, you know, pick another topic, for example, and just dig into it on your own. So that's um, what the, the huddle guide looked like, which is sort of also what the huddle program looked like. Sorry, I went over time. Fine. We'll make sure that everybody gets what you have put forth because I love the huddle uh, as an opportunity for us to continue to learn and we'll figure out how to do it in bite-sized pieces so that everybody can, um, can learn it and we can learn together. So Meryl, I just want to say thank you for taking the time to take us all through this. Oh, Clearly, sure. <laughs> on the comments, it was extremely valuable. So on behalf of Stair and Robin, and Catherine uh, for Mighty Networks for All Into with Virginia and everybody who attended tonight, uh, we can't thank you enough. Robin, is there anything you wanna add? Um, just to say that this is the first of many um, Messaging Mondays and next week it will be you and the 34% and the following week, following week it will be about um, messaging to white women. So we hope people will continue this tradition of getting together to talk about messaging on Mondays. Is that and with Galvanize? Yes, it like is, it? with Galvanize. Okay. And that the recording will be available tomorrow as well as, so, as soon as Meryl gets me the material that will be included as well. Great. Meryl, thank you so much. All right, thank you. I'll try to get that out to you tonight before I forget. <laughs> Wait, what's, what's our homework? <laughs> Uh, Mira, do you have homework for us? Sure. Um, so well, what's the, the what's the most pressing issue right now in Virginia? Everything. Um, yeah. Well, we're the, gun, we're the guns, the guns, yeah. the guns. I think it's got to be the guns. And so, overcoming the apathy and people feeling that their vote doesn't matter and they don't want to turn up. Exactly. Exactly. We have to message. So I would, that, I mean, whatever. I would yeah. suggest yeah. thinking about, um, and you could then use different subject matters, but thinking about crafting a letter to the editor and you're all over the state. So that's great. You're not submitting to the same papers. So um, writing a letter to the editor using the three V's that encourages your fellow citizens to, you know, get out and vote. And why do you think it's so important, whether it's guns or 
you know, school board races and, you know, education of your children or, you know, abortion, whatever you might feel is the most significant. So that, that's what I think it should be your homework. Um, write a letter to the editor, send it out. That's good homework. I think that's good homework. The writing team would be very happy to hear about that. So I got lots of letters that ought to be coming. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Meryl. Thanks, everybody. All right, have a good night, everyone. Have a good night.